Thank you so much. I'm just thrilled to be here, to be able to, to talk with everybody about some of our passions out here at Stanford. And my, my presentation is going to be focused um, mostly around community engaged science to advance health equity. So this kind of research really takes the global village. So I always like to start by just doing a uh, shout out here, at least on the screen, for our US collaborators, as well as our international collaborators. So I've got several goals for this presentation. The first is to share some of the steps taken and life lessons learned in my own developing a research career. And then I'll be highlighting some favorite research studies in my journey that really focus on advancing health equity through digital behavioral health interventions and community engaged citizen science. And then we'll have a fun time engaging in some question and answer periods together. So I have a question for you to start things off, just for you to think about, and I'd love it if you could put your ideas in the chat. Out of all of the numbers linked with people's health, what number do you think best predicts your health as you get older? So I'll let you think about that for a little bit. And Siam, you can tell me if you're starting to see anything <laughs> in the chat. Uh, and then as we're talking uh, further, you can continue to think about that. Okay, that someone hit the jackpot and they, they gave my favorite answer, which is zip code <laughs> or postal code. We know that postal or zip code alone is a predictor of up to 20 year differences in life expectancy. Uh, income is another one. So I'm thrilled that some of those um, showed up. Oftentimes we think more about our clinical measures and those are important no question age can be important too um, but we often forget about the environmental and social determinants of health so you're going to hear about some of that from me today so i'd like to start by just sharing with you um, some of my own career journey and some of the life lessons i've learned along the way <clears throat> so the roots of my personal and professional journey of discovery started here. And as you look at this photo, you're probably thinking, well, that's just her, you know, that's, that's how I look. Well, in fact, <clears throat> sorry, uh, this is my twin sister, my identical twin sister, Sandy. So actually, my first life lesson was I discovered that it's really important to discover what drives and motivates you. And for me, differentiating myself from my twin was really a major motivator for me. So some of the early questions on my mind included things like, why do I do the things I do? And why do others do the things they do? And among our, the early lessons that I've learned around this, one was that context and environments and our perceptions of them matter. And so this is the zip code thing. And well, I'll be talking about that a lot today. The second is what I like to call the lesson of the black dog. When I was growing up in my family of six people, four daughters and our parents, our father came to us one day and told us that finally, after years of begging, he was going to let us get a dog. And my older sister sat us down and said, OK, we can get a white dog or a brown dog or a yellow dog or a red dog, but we cannot get a black dog. I just do not want a black dog. So we went to the Humane, Humane Society and lo and behold, this is who we came home with, Silky, our black dog. And so this lesson, I think for me, speaks to the fact that we need to really stay open to unexpected possibilities. And there was a corollary to this years later, which is never turn down a job you haven't been offered. In other words, don't turn down potential opportunities out of hand without really exploring them first. 
My self-discovery search led to an undergraduate degree in psychology at Binghamton University in New York, where I was able to participate in research on gender identity development in preschoolers and autism, mental illness in youth and adults. And the lesson I learned here is that working with unpredictable and challenging youth and adults was actually good training experience for graduate school and academic jobs. So some of the additional lessons I learned had to do with the fact that following shoulds and musts, this is when someone tells you, you should do this, you must do that. I found that they may not lead to either happiness or success. And so I've learned that it's better for me at least to follow my gut and my instincts and not just do what other people expect me to do. So the, the bottom line is serendipity happens, but you make your own luck. Or luck happens when preparation meets opportunity. And of course, for me and everybody, I think um, in whatever field we're in, really the right mentors can make all the difference. So my undergraduate education led to a PhD in clinical psychology from Virginia Tech University. And that was another sort of follow your gut decision on my part. Um, this department was similar to the Binghamton department that I enjoyed so much. It was new and up and coming. There were a lot of young research oriented faculty with new ideas and in particular ideas not related, not related just to mental health, but also to health behavior and interventions around that. The faculty also understood the importance of environmental and social context surrounding individuals' health behaviors. And that was pretty unique back then for a clinical psych program to be engaged with. So the per some of my personal discoveries about clinical psychology, one was that people who go into clinical psychology, I found, tend to study what they were having their own difficulties with sort of the why do I do the things I don't do or should do and I don't do. So um, for me, this meant regular exercise and stress and stress management. So that led to my graduate school research choices, which occurred in real world contexts and they focused on interventions. For my thesis, I did um, some interventions looking at increasing exercise behavior in college women. And my doctoral work focused on enhancing stress-related coping strategies in different populations. And among some of the insights gained were that changing health-related behaviors I found really fun and challenging. Love can be found in the oddest places, meaning I met my future husband while I was in graduate school. The right peers can really help you grow. Publishing is really hard. You have to work at it. And I definitely, at the end of my PhD, decided that I did not want to work in an academic setting. So this, as you probably can see, became another black dog lesson. So the first year of clinical psychology residency, uh, I went to uh, the University of Mississippi Medical Center. So in clinical psychology, typically we have four years of training and research and practicum work. And then we go out to a one-year clinical psychology internship or residency. Um, I'd been accepted to an Ivy League university for that, but I actually surprised myself by choosing a research-oriented clinical consortium in Mississippi. And that was a wonderful program that had been started by Stuart Agris, who became known as the father of behavioral medicine, which is the field I'm in. Um, that residency was an applied research and publishing mecca. It's where I learned a lot about how to publish my scientific research. And I also embrace the goal of wanting to have an impact that went beyond one-on-one -on -one treatments. It really focused on prevention and community. So after this residency, I was really thinking about where should I go next? The expected path back then 
for research-oriented psychologists was faculty positions. But my path really told me that I, I needed more experience and that a postdoctoral fellowship might actually be better for me before I jumped into a faculty position. And as it turned out, there was an available postdoc at Stanford University's Heart Disease Prevention Program that focused on prevention and community engaged um, projects and work. And that was really what I thought I really wanted to do. And lo and behold, the postdoc training director at that point was none other than Stuart Agers, the person that had started the Mississippi uh, Internship Residency Program. So the plan was for us to stay two years and then head back east. So you can see how most of the red dots here are on the east coast. And that's where my husband and I came from. And we thought we would just stay for our postdocs and then head back east. Well, that was back in the 1980s. And what happened is that we experienced what is known as Northern California's Hotel California Syndrome, which is based on the song by the Eagles, Hotel California. And essentially it means you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. A lot of us found that once we got to the Northern California area, it was really hard to think about going back. So my programmatic research path during my postdoc started when I came into Stanford, I was doing a lot of theory-based individual and group short-term behavioral health interventions, but I was really drawn to try to increase the complexity and variety of what I was doing in my research. So I expanded the populations and really started to focus to larger population-based recruitment, bilingual mediated interventions, and uh, by that, I mean, interventions not delivered face to face, but in some other way. And back then, all we had were phones. And so that that was the mediated intervention I specialized in and then really following people for longer time periods. I also extended my research to underserved populations, older adults, family caregivers, ethnic minorities and poor sleepers. And I broadened a lot of what I was doing and expanded out to different disciplines who became collaborators with me. And Stanford was just a wonderful, wonderful place to do that. So my major questions of interest have changed from which interventions work to what I call the witch's conundrum, which has to do with which programs for which subgroups of people aimed at which behaviors under which environmental context to achieve which benefits, what we call precision behavioral health. My, my programmatic research now includes healthy aging, including across the life course, borderless health promotion, where we work with customized digital health solutions to try to reach as broad an audience as possible, environmental and policy engaged citizen science, my particular passion, which I'll be talking more about, and reducing health disparities <clears throat> worldwide. And of course, in my, my lab, I couldn't leave out chocolate. That's, that's a major driver of um, our activities in my lab. So I'm gonna share some of the meta lessons and lessons that I've learned and one key meta lesson I learned at Stanford was nothing succeeds like persistence with the following addendums. I think it's important to give it all, your all, but to know when to stop and to accept defeat with dignity. So I learned that I had to be persistent to succeed at Stanford. I'll share with you some of Stanford's immutable, in other words, unchangeable, principles, um, which I was told about when I first came to Stanford. So the first was that I was told that people only stay on the postdoc for two years and then you have to leave. Well, me and several other people were able to stay for three years. Then we were told no there's no mechanism to stay after the postdoc. Faculty positions are impossible to get and you'll have to leave. And so several of us looked around and actually found that we could get onto what was known as an academic staff line. 
to continue doing some of the research that we loved. Then I was told that there would be no faculty positions available in Stanford Medical School, so I shouldn't even think about that. Well, one such faculty position did become available in 1990. Then I was told that no PhD would compete successfully for that position if it came available because it was in the medical school. Um, but I was able to successfully compete for it and was named an assistant professor in that position back in 1992. Then I was told that they'll never give you tenure. Um, well, I got tenured in 1998. And then I was told, well, they're gonna treat you like a second class citizen regardless. And well, I served as division chief and had other leadership positions and uh, was an awarded and endowed professorship in 2022. So the lesson I here learned is persistence can pay off as long as you're strategic about it. So meta lesson number two has to do with the three things in human life that are important that Henry James talked about and I completely agree with. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. I think personal integrity, support and respect for others is key in any kind of place that you may end up. Meta lesson number three is if you don't know where you're going, any path will do. So it's really important to chart your own personal goals and to really be thoughtful about that. Mentorship, I've always found is key, critical for learning the ropes and for your career development. If you can't find someone locally, it's good to branch out and look for people elsewhere, but never believe everything that important people tell you. Other potential pearls of wisdom, stay flexible so that opportunities can be recognized. Take opportunities to learn new skills and really push yourself beyond your comfort level. I think the world's becoming increasingly, as we all know, interdisciplinary, technology driven and global. And so we just need to keep that in mind as we make our choices. And there is more to life than careers. I think it's important to identify what's important to you and include those things in each day. And finally, make it fun. And if it's not fun and exciting, then change it. So now I'm going to talk about my research and highlight some of my favorite studies. And they're going to be in several areas. One is promising information and communication technologies in the health promotion disease prevention area, what we call ICT, and community engaged citizen science to advance health equity and environmental justice. So technology, well, we all know that technology is a major driver of many of our comforts and conveniences and advances, but it's also engineered regular movement and other positive health behaviors out of our daily lives. So the big question is how can we really harness technology for good in the health promotion area? So I'm gonna give you one possibility, which is community engaged citizen science that brings together researchers plus public and private organizations plus residents. And the goal is to really harness the potential of ICT and mobile devices and sensing to solve the health promotion challenge. Now we can apply this kind of approach to different ICT domains, including the me domain and the we domain. The me domain focuses on individually adapted IT interventions. And I'm gonna share with you three areas that we've worked in, telehealth, virtual advisors, and smartphone app platforms. So starting with telehealth by computer, we were very interested in the question, can automated systems replace human instructors in promoting regular physical activity? And our automated systems were interactive voice response systems, which are the computer driven human voices that you hear anytime now you dial and to call up 
any sort of website or phone number for any kind of service. You're not, we all know we're not speaking to a human, we're speaking to a human sounding computer. So what we did is we randomized uh, a number of inactive middle, middle aged and older adults to either get a human phone advisor or an automated phone advisor that sounds like a human, but it's really a computer. And what we found, as you can see here, that both of these arms, the green, which is the human phone advisor, and the red, the automated phone advisor, people assigned to both of those did significantly better than the control arm, and there was no difference between um, people who got human or automated phone advisors, and actually people were able to maintain their physical activities, even when those two types of advisors were taken away at 12 months and were able to stay active through the 18 month period that we studied. So another side to personal technology is really preventing widening of the health disparities gap or the digital divide because of language issues, reading levels, computer access or comfort with computers, and health literacy issues. And so virtual advisors provide tailored interactions using both simple verbal as well as nonverbal communication. So I want you to meet Carmen. Carmen was developed at Stanford in collaboration with computer scientists at Northeastern University in Boston. And Carmen speaks English and Spanish and you interact with her using a simple touchscreen interface. So the first study we did with Carmen was a four month study with low income Latino or Latinx older adults who had very low computer literacy. Many of them had never touched a computer before. And you can see at four months, Carmen did very well in being able to counsel them to increase their minutes per week of physical activity relative to the control. And at four months, after the study had ended, we asked the inter intervention participants what they thought about Carmen. And they told us that they felt that Carmen cared about them. They felt close to Carmen. They trusted Carmen. And they were interested in continuing to work with Carmen. And they did so over the next five months after the research ended. So what happened was at, at the four month post-test when we were done with the study, the Stanford computer that housed Carmen needed to go back to Stanford. And as we began to dismantle that computer, our participants said, no, please don't take Carmen from us. We would like to work with Carmen a little longer. And so we left Carmen in, in the community center where she was being accessed for the next five months. And so this became a natural experiment because the study had ended and now we could see how people were using Carmen. And in fact, 95% of the people who had been assigned to the intervention continued to use Carmen. So the next step was to put Carmen head to head with human advisors. Could she do as good a job as, as our human advisors? And so we had a one-year effectiveness trial of Carmen versus trained peer advisors, again, an inactive Latino or Latinx aging adults. And they were, the interventions were delivered in community centers and in low income neighborhoods in the Bay Area. And so in pitting the, the Carmen head to head with our humans, we found that they were similarly effective in promoting recommended levels of weekly walking and they also showed similar benefits for 12 month weight loss and lowered resting blood pressure levels as well. So the third area, the third me area or individual area are smartphone apps, uh, very popular as we all know and very ubiquitous including for underserved communities. And for behavioral scientists, they've really had a paradigm shifting ability to provide just in time feedback for behavior change, which is incredible. Uh, but few of these apps actually employ or have evaluated other types of behavioral strategies to systematically enhance motivation, 
and behavior over time. So we developed three apps for walking more and sitting less using different motivational frames. So the analytic frame, as you see here on the left, uh, uses uh, your typical facts and figures to try to motivate people in terms of setting goals and did you reach your goals, percentage of your goals that you met. And so you could see it all there on the screen. This is the most common type of fitness app that we see out there. The second app, the App Factor Play app, has absolutely no numbers because not everybody resonates to numbers. Uh, this app has a little bird avatar. So the avatar reflects back how active the user is in real time. So if you're very active during the day, your little bird is very active too. He's flying, he's flying faster than United jumbo jets and all this kind of stuff. Uh, if you are uh, inactive during the day, your little bird will be sitting in a tree looking sort of forlorn and sad. The third app is the social app, which combines, I think, some of the better attributes of the first two apps and that it uses avatars to represent groups of people. One is you and your virtual group, and the other is a different virtual group, and it uses social influence feedback so that you can see how well you're doing both relative to your group as well as, as well as the other group when it comes to the amount of activity that you're doing. So here is another question for you all. So get ready to put something in the chat, which is which one of these three apps did, do you think did best? And Siam will tell me <laughs> when we have enough responses. We have lots of responses, and it looks like the vast majority are saying social. Okay, that's very interesting, and that's the right answer. <laughs> we have a very smart audience out there. So at least initially, for the initial startup of activity that these people were doing, the social app did best with the little birdie app second and the analytic app for a third, but remember the wishes conundrum, the, the witch's conundrum that I talked about earlier, which is it's not as important which did best. What we really want to know is which types of people would do best with which types of apps, because we do know there are some people who love the analytic app, other people hated the social app. So it's really a, a matter of matching people to the kinds of interventions that are gonna work best for them. So let's go up a level to the we domain. And the we domain has to do with empowering people as citizen scientists to assess and improve not only their own health, but the health of their local uh, neighborhoods and community environments. So let me tell you a little bit about citizen science. It's a centuries old tradition of resident engagement here in the US started with the founding fathers. And the definition we use of citizen is the traditional one, which is an inhabitant of a particular town or city without regard to legal status. So today there are at least three general types of citizen science. For the people, citizen science where people can donate their bio biological specimens, they fill out questionnaires, it's your traditional biomedical research very important, but participants' um, involvement tends to end at the clinic door. Citizen science with the people involves more active data collection on the part of residents, um, counting things like birds or mushrooms or people on the street or all kinds of things. It's very popular in ecology and natural sciences, astronomy and the like. But again, once the data are collected, they're typically pushed up to either researchers or other organizations, and then the resident, the participant uh, is no longer involved. We do what we call by the people citizen science, where we try to get residents involved in all aspects of the science inquiry as much as possible, from helping to set goals and objectives, 
they not only collect data, but they also help to interpret their data. And they work with the scientists and uh, other people, stakeholders in their communities to co-create solutions. So why, why should we bother with citizen science? Well, one reason is to reduce marginalization of under-resourced groups and communities. Many of those groups feel isolated, unconnected, and left out of decision-making in their community. And there's really good evidence that disengagement and powerlessness is linked to worsened mental health, negative health behaviors, feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, reduced community participation, and missed opportunities to help others, which we know is also linked with better mental health. It can also help to reduce the public's mistrust of science, which has been growing by directly engaging community members in the scientific process. We can help to demystify science, make it more accessible and inclusive, and these things can help to advance health equity. Now, I'm, I'm guessing that you all know the difference between equity and equality, but just to be sure, I have this slide up here where equality is where each person or group is treated the same. They're given the same resources or opportunities regardless of circumstance. Equity is providing each person with the specific resources and opportunities needed to achieve an optimal outcome. So I'm going to talk about one example of the By the People citizen science activity, and it's the Our Voice research initiative. Our Voice empowers residents to assess and advocate for healthier neighborhoods and communities with scientists and with local decision makers. The trained facilitators that help them with this process can be community organizations, researchers, government groups, businesses, or local opinion leaders or residents themselves. This kind of citizen science is based on the premise that among the most underutilized renewable resources to promote human and planetary health and equity are residents themselves. So our voice starts with an easy to use mobile app called the Neighborhood Discovery Tool. Residents, regardless of their tech literacy or language, can use this app to assess community features that either promote or hinder active and healthy living. Um, it's currently in 13 languages and growing, and we can translate this app into almost any language as long as it's got a written language component to it. The app collects neighborhood information via GPS route tracking and walking maps. It uses geotech photos and audio text or text narratives, and then very simple ratings of, of activities. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. The app's available with a project code that is given to people from Stanford. It's available on either Apple or Android uh, systems. It can be used on virtually any mobile device. And we've had successful users anywhere from ages nine to over 95 years of age. So the guiding question that people use can, is developed by the research group or the community group in collaboration with their residents. And it goes something like this. What makes it easy or hard to, depending on your project focus, be physically active, access healthy foods, feel safe in your community, control your stress, avoid COVID, maintain your medical regimen, whatever, whatever is of importance and interest to the community can be looked at as long as there's an environmental component to it. So the geotag photos and narrative data are accessible and meaningful to residents, decision makers, and researchers alike. And this is a data point from the app. And what you see here in the photo, you see a crossing way that, you know, crosswalk. And gee, usually we think crosswalks are great. But look, this resident has given this crosswalk a thumbs down, as you can see by the red frowny face, so marked it as not good for the community. 
And when you read the text, you understand why. It's because this crosswalk leads to a ditch. It does not make it all the way across the street um, to safety. So this is why we love to have both the photo and the auditory narrative, the story behind it, because it really gives us the fuller story of what's going on. Um, the data can be grouped to identify community hotspots. Here you see green are the positive features among the group of citizen scientists that collected these data, red negative and orange, a mix of positive and negative features. So after the data are collected in a facilitated process, they can be either remote or in person, residents share their collected photos and stories with other residents. They build consensus around high priority and realistic areas for change. And they share their data with key decision makers and together develop feasible, realistic solutions and then formulate action steps to activate local change. So our voice aims to affect multiple levels of impact from individual to social and community built environment and policy levels. And it combines both qualitative and quantitative data methods. So the quantitative methods, as I know many of you know, has to do with emphasizing objectivity, amount or quantity of things. It's typically investigator defined and controlled and big issues are reproducibility and uh, of the methods and results is what I like to think of in the sports arena as the play by play. Qualitative data and methods capture the lived experience in real world contexts, and they foster a depth of understanding that you usually can't get with quantitative methods. And we, I think of this as the color commentary uh, of what's going on. So mixed methods that combine both of these strategies can help us more fully understand especially complex constructs being studied, which is what behavioral scientists study, social, behavioral, cultural, and environmental phenomena. And these mixed methods designs are particularly useful in part on participatory action research because they combine the credibility of numbers with the affective and emotional impact of personal narratives and influencing policy and decision makers. Oftentimes um, reaching people's brains is just not enough. You gotta reach their hearts too. And uh, among the kinds of multi-dimensional outcome measures that are used in these mixed methods are, as we heard, the qualitative measures, geospatial information, mapping, visualizations, quantitative assessment, mobile sensing, and observational data. So I'd like to give you a little more information about our voice data collection. The number of presidents and projects to date have ranged anywhere from seven to over 240, with an average size being about 40 citizen scientists per project. And we have found that as few as seven to 10 residents can obtain consensus around top barriers and enablers in an area, as long as it's a specific issue in a particular area or locale. Now with small numbers, of course, scientists worry about selection bias and what that could do. But I'd like to point out that while selection bias is of prime importance when major outcomes are at an individual level, changes in people's blood pressure or things like that, remember that what I'm talking about here have to do with primary outcomes being at the environmental and policy levels. So that means this kind of selection bias becomes a bit less important because we're, and in fact, some people have argued it's actually more resource efficient to have small numbers of people who can make big changes in environmental and policy levels of impact. Having said that, we still believe that we, it's very useful to, to describe who the citizen scientists are, how they're recruited, and how the studies they're involved with impact their own behaviors and beliefs. I also want to just mention uh, 
a bit about privacy and data protections, a huge issue with digital data that we're all grappling with. Um, the anonymous discovery tool data are uploaded to a secure Stanford server where collective data reports are generated for community facilitators who then return the data back to the citizen scientists to discuss and to interpret. The discovery tool secure data repository is reviewed and approved by three offices, at least at Stanford, the Human Subjects Protections Office, the Privacy Office, and a number of other offices, and it's EU compliant. Additionally, um, collaborating research organizations, like if there was a study at Johns Hopkins with us, they would obtain their own human subjects and ethics approval from their respective the respective academic institution. So I'm going to share with you some of the projects that we've done here with, with our voice. The initial pilot study was in East Palo Alto, California, which at that time was the most impoverished community in um, the peninsula area. And we focused on public housing sites with low income seniors of color. And we found that the older adult residents with support from our, our voice staff could use the basic mobile app to identify neighborhood assets and barriers to physical activity and healthy eating. They were able to discuss, organize, interpret, and prioritize their data and advocate for change with local decision makers. And in response, the city planning committee and city council made changes and investments to enhance the community infrastructure for active living. And some of these successes including included that they created a safer walking environment by repairing streets and sidewalks in East Palo Alto. They improved access to the senior center for the seniors. They developed a community garden with the local organizations who taught this, the residents how to garden and cook the vegetables that they were growing. They discovered a nearby food market actually had more fresh produce than originally thought. So this is why we focus on community assets and not just barriers, because oftentimes people don't appreciate what's positive about their communities. And this is a way for them to rediscover the positive aspects of their communities. And the city also appropriated new funds for environmental analysis and the seniors who were involved reported increased cohesion, engagement and confidence in making local community changes. So you can see that all four of our levels of impact shown on the right part of the slide, individual policy and built environment and social and community impacts were successfully changed. Uh, we've done a number of studies uh, and one, our first international study was done in Israel, focusing on seniors and how to help seniors become more active. And there, multicultural senior groups used our voice walkability data to actually develop a senior friendly walking map. They then built partnerships with local businesses to support the walking route. They were able to increase seating and shade along the walking route, and they engaged the city mayor in launching the new route. And again, you can see that all four levels of impact were successfully changed. We've done a lot of things in South America. Colombia is one of our favorite partners. They're fantastic. Our, the group at uh, Universidad de los Andes and uh, they've done a number of our voice projects. Um, one has to do with reducing health hazards around schools. And in this project, students nine to 18 years of age from low income areas coordinated efforts to reduce public health hazards, things like stagnant water. They also successfully advocated for improved infrastructure, which included things like traffic safety measures, and they were successful in getting healthier food options in their school environment. And the students also reported individually that they felt an increased sense of shared responsibility to ensure the proper use of school facilities. So again, all four levels of impact were changed. In Sweden, 
there were environmental factors that were focused on that could impact physical activity and the, the citizen scientists here were adolescents from low income areas who assessed local environmental features. Among their recommendations was they really felt they needed more walking and bike paths and better lighting for public spaces and increased access to public sports facilities in their neighborhood. Uh, the teen engagement we found really inspired further research in Sweden, which is going on right now to really link these kinds of activities with students' motivations to stay in school and graduate. So we've worked in eight sectors and settings so far using our voice. These include neighborhood and communities at large, parks, greenways and waterways, schools, clinics, food outlets, work sites, public housing and transit. And if you can think of any more, any other kinds of sectors or settings that you'd be interested in, please go ahead and put them in the chat. That would be great. So the early successes led to an increased demand for this kind of project. And we were very fortunate in 2016 to receive a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation plan to help us build an Our Voice Global Citizen Science Research Network. And you can see here all of the various countries that have been partnering with us during this time um, to do Our Voice projects. So far, we have over 100 projects spanning at least 20 US states, 25 plus countries across six continents. And we have over 30 partnering universities. So again, if you have any ideas about places um, that you think um, would be, we'd be able to um, partner with people there, put, put your ideas in the chat. So just to give you a, a summary of the demonstrated successes in usually low resource communities are often our groups that we work with, things like infrastructure repairs, local walkability, public transit support, more greenery and gardens, healthier school environments and safer routes to school, increased access to healthy foods, um, more age-friendly community events and groups, safer indoor clinical environments. You'd be surprised how many clinical environments make it very hard for people in wheelchairs to actually get around those environments. Safer activity supportive parks and rec recreational spaces and increases in agency efficacy and connectedness. So I'd like to share with you just some of the goals for the new scientific directions and, and scale up that we're currently working on. We, uh, we would love to build an online interactive world map of citizen science data where all of the data being collected across the world could be placed on a map where people could see it and use it to get ideas of their own for their own communities and then to link it with other data platforms and ecosystems like big data. And I'll give you an example of what we're doing around big data. Um, we're integrating macro scale data. So the, these are the big data sets across countries usually with our voice micro scale or lived experience data. Here is just a small map of the, the US's social vulnerability index which is collected by the, the CDC. And we've been able, and I should say this, this research has been led by two of our incredible doctoral students at Stanford in the Department of Epidemiology. And the pins you see here represent the Our Voice photos that have been taken. And you can actually filter those photos um, by different tags in terms of where are all the problem areas, where are the better areas, this kind of thing. And if you click on the pins, you, it'll show you the corresponding image and comments from the citizen science walk. Now we, we love this kind of research because it really opens our eyes to what we can learn from these different kinds of data, big data, 
and the micro scale data that we get from our voice. It's more of the lived experience. So here I'll give you a couple of examples. So we worked in four Santa Clara County postal codes and we mapped out the social vul vulnerability index in those postal codes, as well as the Our Voice Citizen Science data, the boots on the ground data being collected by the residents. And some of the insights that we found showed that the two postal areas differing the most in social vulnerability index actually had very similar percentages of local features rated as barriers to active living. So even though you might think that the more vulnerable neighborhood would be looking worse, in fact, when you walked around those neighborhoods, they were very similar. We also did this with the macro data, the big data that came from the US National Walkability Index. And some of the insights here were, although even though the four zip codes we were looking at had similar national walkability scores for the National Walkability Index, they had much greater variability in the percentage of local features residents rated as barriers. So to being able to walk in the neighborhood. So I think combining this, this is the mixed methods approach, um, combining these two very different types of data can really give you much larger insights. A second scientific direction we've been doing is combining quantitative and uh, quantitative and mobile sensing data with our voice. So here's a study by one of our postdoctoral fellows where he had people using uh, the discovery tool and also wearing a wrist-worn sensor of electrodermal and heart rate activity, and which helped him to really be able to identify locations. In this case, in San Francisco, along walking routes where people were experiencing increased stress and arousal. A third scientific direction has to do with using new technologies to help people imagine change which we think can really enhance both engagement and impact among both residents and decision makers. And I'll give you the example of Bogota, Colombia, where they have a project or a, a um, issue there that has to do with unpaid women caregivers. And so they have developed these wonderful care centers called Manzanas de Cuidado. And so for, for you all that maybe are less familiar with unpaid women caregivers. Globally, we know that women spend over four hours a day doing unpaid care work versus much fewer hours for men. And Bogota has these wonderful care blocks that contain services for caregivers in low-income neighborhoods. So this is very innovative. Um, but they, they were struggling with trying to understand what was keeping the women from getting to these care blocks. So they wanted to identify facilitators and barriers to actually accessing the local care blocks. And to do that, to better understand the caregiver's lived experience, we were able to connect them with virtual reality. And so one of our wonderful undergraduates who was trained in using virtual reality on technology, spent a month down in Colombia working with the researchers there and teaching them how to really immerse the caregivers as well as the policymakers in their specific locate, walking locations through using virtual reality while they listen to the participants' audios of their perceptions. And what I love about this study is that the researchers taught the caregivers how to use the virtual reality goggles. And then it was the caregiver citizen scientists who then trained the policymakers in, in being able to use them to really understand what that lived experience was like. And both the participants and the decision makers found the virtual reality to be easy to use. They felt it could enhance the our voice method and could really facilitate dialogue and help to create innovative solutions. And here's a quote from one of the policymakers, virtual reality takes you to the place. The audio helps us to live the experience of the caregivers. 
And virtual reality allows us to understand the perspectives of the people that live there. And we need to really improve many factors of their environment. A fourth one has to do with uh, ripple effects. And I'll give you a, an example from a California food access project, which began here in San Mateo County. And the project focused specifically on improving local food conditions and access for low income seniors. It was funded, funded by the local county health department and it lasted for three months. And then the project ended. So the uh, people were trained in the Our Voice method. They used that method. They met with the county people and then the project was done. Well, we found out at nine months that those citizen scientists had taken the skills they'd learned in the food project and they were able to use them to advocate for and improve a dangerous street segment in their local area. At 12 months, we learned that they had gone to Sacramento, California, the state capital, and advocate for affordable senior housing. And then at 24 months, we learned that they had used the air voice method to actually address speeding drivers in their neighborhood. So our question is, what's next? This is the kind of empowerment model, I think, when we do participatory research, research to action kinds of projects, that you, you give people the skills to be able to then to move ahead and changing all kinds of things for the better in their environments. So just very quickly, um, additional areas include mental health and intellectual disability. We're looking more specifically at clinical environments and how they can be improved through citizen science. Uh, we've done a lot of projects in parks, looking at park use, urban nature, green space to promote human and planetary health and vitality. Uh, we've done violence prevention, gender-based violence projects. One occurred at Stanford campus with students, with undergraduate and graduate students. And so I would love to hear your ideas, whatever ideas you may have about the kinds of areas or projects or issues that you think could be a good place to use this kind of citizen science. So don't forget, put them in the chat if you have any ideas around that. So in sum, our growing vision is a world of vital and thriving communities for all. And I'd just like to close with a, a partial quote from someone often attributed to Margaret Mead and others that says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. So there's our website. And on our website, you will find all kinds of descriptions and our research studies and our papers and um, who our network uh, is involved with and the people that are part of our network and everything. So I hope you'll come visit the website. So I'd like to thank you all. I hope you're still there. Um, and now uh, it's time for questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. So Siam, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Uh, students, yes, if you do have any questions, please use the raise hand function on Zoom, uh, and then we'll try and call on as many of you uh, as we can. Uh, I think we'll have about 30 minutes for questions. Um, so first, we have Rebecca from Indiana. Yes. Um, hi, Dr. King. First, I would like to say thank you so much for that awesome presentation. Um, I found like I found your impacts in like so many different parts of the world so inspiring and I aspire to be that impactful one day. Um, I was just uh, curious, like throughout like the different projects you did, especially on a global scale, like in Latin America, for example, um, what would you say like was the most, I guess, like difficult part of successfully implementing your project and how were you able to like overcome that? What a great question, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thanks for your nice comments that made my day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> um, in terms, I, I think 
a key ingredient for this kind of work is that you need community involvement. You need at least one community member or organization that is dedicated and passionate to mm -hmm. the, for this kind of thing without, and it can be one person, <laughs> We've had studies that have been very successful. It was one person in the community that rallied other community members, and then they were able to go to community organizations. Sometimes it's community organizations, departments of public health, local grassroots organizations that share the same goals and the same passion and compassion when it comes to uh, health equity and things. So I would say that that's the, the major uh, reason why I think these projects succeed. Without that, it's, it is, as you know, it's very difficult anyway to keep people involved because people, you know, life happens and someone may be excited. The, the nice thing I, I think about these projects, they're short. So within two months, three months, you can rally people, teach them the skills and they can make actual tangible, realistic differences in their communities. And that's huge because once they see success, you know, success begets success. Then they get motivated to try something else and to bring in other people. And so I think the, that's the key ingredient. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Next, we have uh, Atul from Michigan. Uh, hi, Dr. King. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's really hard to keep teenagers engaged with the PowerPoint for an hour, but I can probably say that you've succeeded. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> so um, my question is, uh, I'm from Michigan. I noticed that Michigan was on your map of areas that um, our voice has, has impacted. I think an underrated issue in Michigan is like lack of education equity. I'm privileged to be in a, one mm -hmm. of the best school districts in the state, but I acknowledge that it's not that way in like the entire state of Michigan. Like I'm pretty sure Michigan ranks like in the bottom 15 of US states in like standardized test scores. So could you like like talk in like more detail about like one of like what you'd say is like one of the most like prolific like projects our voice has taken on, like related to um education, like K through 12. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question, Atul. Thank you. Um I, I there we've had a number and a growing number of school and youth projects. And that's a part of our voice I am so excited about because you all are the future. <laughs> it's your dedication and your passion that's gonna literally save the world, I think. Um, so we, we love working with youth and once youth are empowered, they can do incredible things. So um, the Columbia Project is a great one and that is published. So if you go onto my website, our website, ourvoice.stanford.edu, you'll find a bunch of different school-based and educational projects. There's another one that just finished in New Zealand with that included Aboriginal populations. It's also very, very interesting. They're just now submitting that for publication. Um, they worked in four different high schools and uh, had very, very interesting results. And so the school work we've done, uh, the educational work, and I, I think it's so important because a lot of times students drop out and the dropout is so, strongly related to success, to everything, to health, to success. So keeping students in school, at least through high school, if not beyond, is a critical global need. So I would love it if you all were gonna, if you were gonna work on that in, in your own area, because I think we, you know, how do you keep students involved? And a lot of them are disengaged, but this is one way to engage them around things that they care about at their local school. And it's one way I think to teach empowerment skills. So then they feel like they can make a change and hopefully that'll keep them in school and maybe tackling other things. But I'd love it if you could visit our website and see, or any ideas then too, you can leave ideas on our website as well in terms of suggestions for things or questions, any of those things we love to look at. 
Thank you. Uh, next, we have a group from California. Hi. Um, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I find it like really inspiring and I found it um, really interesting to hear about. Um, so what I wanted to ask you was about how if you throughout your projects, if you have seen um, how journalism has helped engage the community and um, promoting public health awareness and things like that, if you've seen its impact. Thank you, Akru. That, that's a really, really interesting question. I think journalism comes down to storytelling, doesn't it? And I think learning how to tell stories that mix together evidence that's true and real evidence with the emotional hook that really puts you there, that, that really helps you to understand what people are going through is huge. Uh, we would love to see more journalist students actually participating in our, our voice studies and projects. Uh, we have a great um, communication department at Stanford, but your question makes me realize that we really haven't tapped them as much as we used to tap them in the early days of my research. And I, I think journalism can really bring a lot of interesting dialogue, narrative, storytelling um, to get and getting the word out. You know, the best ways of using social media to get the word out and not have it, not have a backlash with negativity or something around that. I don't know if you have any ideas about that. Send them to us on our website. I'd love to hear them. Mm hmm.